This podcast is brought to you by Deepbridge Capital LLP. Deepbridge is authorised and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority. Please note that investments discussed are both illiquid and high risk and won't be suitable for all investors and should be considered as part of a diversified portfolio. The content of this podcast should not be construed as financial or taxation advice. We recommend investors seek appropriate professional financial advice. Any views expressed may no longer be current and may have already been acted upon. Welcome to this Deepish Discovery podcast. My name is Andrew Aldridge. I'm partner and head of marketing at Deepish Capital. The idea of these Discovery podcasts is to bring to life the people and the companies that are within the Deepish portfolios. In this episode, I'm delighted to be joined by Scott Carnegie, chairman of Ocutech, as we look at one of the companies within the Deepish portfolio. Um, so, Scott, um, can you tell us a little bit about the background of founding Architect and, uh, and where it came from, really? Yeah, it um, yeah, Architect's been around for quite a while, um, and people often mistake in the fact that the company was founded back in 2001. Right. And a lot of people will say, goodness me, you know, you've been really slow. Um, <laughs> or what have you been doing for 21 years? And yep. well, I'm pleased to say I've not been here for 21 years. Um, but the company founded at that point. Point. And, and where it came from was a mixture of uh, knowledge spin out from Strathclyde Clyde University, but in particular, the driving force behind it was a, a chap called Professor Neil Graham. Okay. And uh, Professor Neil Graham was probably one of the world's leading polymer chemists. He worked for AstraZeneca. He specialised in uh, PEG, polyethylene glycol, okay. which is the foundation material on which Architect's technology is, is built. Yep. Um, and he worked up uh, that particular material and found a way of stabilizing it so that it had long shelf life. Yep. Lots of people have tried to work with that product before. He found a way of doing it. Um, and uh, that IP was protected originally by AstraZeneca. And then when he retired, he was held in such high regard by AstraZeneca, they donated that IP to him. That's very generous and, of him. And yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, he is such a well-known figure, or was such a well-known figure. Sadly, he's passed away um, and so can't see his dreams being fulfilled. Absolutely. Um, but uh, at that point, he set up companies um, several companies actually to use that technology and the one for the contact lens area was Ocutech that he set up and he right. pulled together a, a management team and group of scientists um, to try and deliver his vision for it um, and the, the vision was that polyethylene glycol is, is a, a substance that lots of people don't realize exists around them a lot okay. uh, but it has the advantages it's inert it doesn't um, doesn't do anything. It's biomimetic, uh, which means the body doesn't reject it. You can okay. put it inside your body and it'll do nothing. Um, and one of the biggest problems with contact lenses is when you put this piece of plastic in your eye, the eye usually rejects it. Absolutely. Unless it's I've made of biomimetic yep. material. Yep. Uh, and that's one of the advantages that PEG material has over other um, the forms of material. Uh, other materials have to be coated to stop people rejecting it. Right. Um, PEG doesn't. Um, and so we are uh, able to produce a uh, contact lens of this material because it also, as well as being biomimetic, holds a lot of water and allows oxygen to pass through it. Right. And those are the other two key elements of why you would make a contact lens with them because those are the two key elements of a contact lens. Absolutely. Other major uh, companies tried to make contact lenses using this material um, but never managed to get it stable and that's okay. where Neil Graham's science came to uh, to fruition uh, and that's why we're able to have that material which is patent protected so and that's really that's where the beginning of the company came from and yeah. I guess I guess because it's it's uh, it's not coated etc like other it, it's cheaper to produce or more efficient to produce is it um, put it this way, it, at the end of the day, that wasn't really our intention, but it is. It's a yep. very cheap material. It, it's very common. For instance, if you see a shiny apple in yep. a supermarket, it's because it's been sprayed with peg. You okay. eat it. 
You can eat peg, not know you're eating it, okay. but it is very commonly used. Stents, for instance, are coated in yep. peg. Um, yep. and, and so these things are, are very, very commonly used, but people just don't realize how common they're used. The fact it doesn't have coating, well, actually, we're actually working on a coating to even improve the right. material and its effect in the eye and how comfortable it'll feel. Um, but it, it's, uh, it isn't an expensive product, no. Brilliant. And I guess you, you say you formed in 2001. Uh, I mean, how long have you been involved? Kind of what's, how's the company evolved since then? What's the kind of latest iteration, if you like, and, and kind of why now, if you like? Yes. Um, well, in, in the early years, up until about 2005, 2006, um, a lot of the scientists were in the lab and, and playing about with this material and the patent that they had to try and create something that they felt was a commercial product. Uh, and when I first joined the company was back in late 2006, 2007, um, as chairman of an angel group called Discovery Investment Fund, sure. um, yep. we decided to invest in this company. Uh, we had been newly formed. It was actually our first investment. Right. Um, and as a result of that, we put a non-exec on the board and that was me. Um, and so my journey with, uh, with Occutex Start architect started at that point um, back late 2006 2007. Since then, we've gone through a, a, a couple of probably major events. Uh, in that, round about 2009, we got on board one of the major contact lens players who took a development license with us okay. to try and create a, an injected molded contact lens, which there are none in the world. Right. Uh, and the advantage of injection molding is cost, cost of goods. Yep. Um, when you make a lens at the moment, it's called cast molding, reaction cast molding, and you have a male and female mold and you press them together. Yep. There are numerous stages in that process, all of which add to cost. If you can inject it into a metal mold, means that you don't have the plastic molds um, and you can do it much faster, much cheaper with much less steps. And so that has always, yeah, and yeah. that has always been the holy grail of the industry, uh, is to reduce the cost of goods. We uh, we think that uh, our material was perfect for it again, and that's why we had this contract back in yep. two thousand and nine. It, that contract lasted until 2013 with that major company who I can't actually name because of um, non-disclosure agreement. Sure. Um, it actually ended up pulling out because it got taken over. Right. And the, and the party who took it over decided they didn't want to spend any more money uh, in development. Yep. Uh, they would rather just uh, do what they had or buy in the product. Yep. Um, and <clears throat> so... That was the, the end of what was a very uh, interesting period for us, where we developed that injected molded uh, variant of our product. Um, but at the point of um, them getting taken over, uh, unfortunately, they'd never created a lens. They'd right. made all the machinery, they yep. knew how to make it, but they hadn't got the formula of the material just right. Uh, and so uh, at that point, the company had to flip back knowing that the purse strings had gone. Yep. Um, six and a half million dollars were injected into Occutech over that period. Right. Our workforce inflated from about 10 to about 100. Right. Um, and uh, we had to then reduce it all back down because the money had stopped. Yep. So fortunately we did. Fortunately we survived. Um, and what we decided to do was to revert back to reaction cast molding, um, which was known technology, known processes, easier to get machinery. Uh, and that's what we then developed from uh, literally the end of 2013, start of 2014, up until just before COVID, right. um, 2019, by which point we developed a reaction cast molded lens, yeah. which was our Occupeg lens. Uh, that Occupeg lens did everything we said it would. We tested it on eye. We're very excited about that. Um, what we then moved on to doing uh, in the period after that was we decided to create a coating. Yep. And so we have created a coating for right. it, um, which is called, uh, <clears throat> sorry, the, it, actually it's the peg lens is the, the, the lens. And we created a coating called Occupeg to go with it. During COVID, we then added the third part of this, 
uh, which is um, in terms of injection molding. We went back to injection molding uh, and what we did for that was we invented the material. We took the learning from the previous yep. project that had been aborted uh, and we were able to create that material in-house here where that major uh, um, proponent in the industry able hadn't been able to achieve. Is that partly because technology had improved over that period of time or is that was it just uh, because you're, you're better at doing it than them? Interesting question. I, I, I think at the end of the day, because... So we had developed the peg lens, the lens itself, in reaction cast yep. moulding. We had a predicate. Yep. And, and what we then were able to do is do very small tweaks, but make it injection mouldable. Got you. The, the material we use is thermoplastic. That's one of the advantages of peg. Uh, and it's thermoresponsive. Uh, and so it, it actually means that it is perfect for injection moulding. Um, and what we were able to do is to take the peg lens that we'd created, tweak the formula very slightly and create one that worked in injection molding, which we've since proven Great. actually goes through an injection molding machine properly. So you, you um, had the product, it was kind of then reverse engineering to make the production correct. technique. Correct. Uh, yeah. At the time of the previous development, um, they stopped all the work on reaction cast molding and they never had a lens or a baseline yep. to create the, the new formula from. Yep. Makes sense. So, Makes sense. Uh, and, and that really brings us up to date. As I say, we're, we're working on that uh, injection molding product. We have the peg lens, uh, CE Mart. We have the uh, solution uh, to go with it, which makes it more comfortable, and we yep. would use it as a packaging solution. The bit for the future is injection molding. From, from where we stand, it's probably uh, two years from now, two to three years with a commercial partner yep. um, will help us bring it to market. But we think it will be significant because it will reduce the cost of goods um, in quite a material way. So, so it will be disruptive. So you've mentioned kind of uh, kind of the background where you've been up to, etc. Um, kind of what are the opportunities that are availing themselves to you now and why and, and kind of you've kind of mentioned some of the USPs, if you like, but what kind of are, are the USPs really of, of what you're doing? Um, the, the advantage of the, the lens that we have is we've tested it against the best in the market. Uh, and the best in the market is globally accepted as being AccuView Oasis, okay. uh, a Johnson & Johnson product. Um, and we've looked also at some of the Alcon um, daily products that they have. Um, those tend to be around about the top goods in the market. And yep. we've done comparison uh, tests by putting our lenses on eye and having people wear one lens in one eye of our competitors and our lens sure. and comparing them. Um, it's called the double blind contralateral study. The okay. person wearing doesn't know which one is which, Excellent. but they have to, to give their opinion on it. Um, and uh, the, the end result of that is that um, we believe that we have a lens that is superior. Yep. So in comfort and wearing experience. Um, so that's really our USP, and it all comes out of the science of the material yep. that allows it to, to take more oxygen in relatively, uh, hold more water, and be moister on the eye. Um, and, and that's really the advantage that we have in that material. And I'm, am I right in thinking that these could be daily disposable or more continued use? Is, is that correct? Yes, yeah, we're capable of using it in both ways. Uh, there's slight differences in the formulation for both, um, but uh, they're very close. But they can be used both as a daily disposable and as a frequent replacement lens. Um, the, what I would say is the major market out there, however, is daily disposable. Yeah, so absolutely. we're aiming at the daily disposable market. And I guess that's, uh, yeah, from, a, from a sales perspective, you'll sell more if they're daily disposable than, uh, than longer term use. Absolutely, yes. No, uh, that's very much the case. Um, in terms of um, what we've found is we've been talking to the main global uh, contact lens companies around the world with this material. Um, they're all interested in it, but um, interestingly, and that's where the funding comes in, uh, and also future funding will come in, um, is that they all go well, we've got X million customers for our existing product. We really like your new product. Can you sell us, send us millions Absolutely. so we can move our customer base over to your lens? Yep. Um, and you end up in a chicken and egg position where 
in order to produce that number of lenses, you've got to buy machinery Absolutely. that allows you to do it. Yeah. Uh, and so that's the reason why uh, we've embarked on a phase of funding, yeah. uh, the initial funding laid by yourselves. And going forward, we will be looking for new and additional funding yep. um, to take us into a more manufacturing phase um, so that we can supply these lenses to people who in turn have said, if we can just get lenses, we'll give them to our customers. We believe you that it's better, yep. but we need to prove it. And I guess for you personally, I mean, that must be an extremely exciting kind of inflection point for you in terms oh, of you've been with the company for such a long time. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. It, it, if you like, it's an underpinning. We always believe and people have always reported they believe us that the lenses are better yeah. but you need to get in market before it starts to be believed by everybody absolutely uh, and and it also is what will attract the interest of other participants in the market yeah. um you know we we regularly speak to the top 10 global companies and they regularly say how are you getting on yeah some of them because they want our product and some of them because they may have an interest in acquiring us and our Ab technology absolutely Absolutely, it's either the product or the IP they're after, isn't it? So, uh, and, and both comes with a price. So, yeah, yes, absolutely. indeed. Yeah. indeed. Um, so, kind of other than kind of obviously this exciting moment now, kind of what have there been particular highlights over the last uh, kind of 10, 12, 13 years, or, or longer than you care to remember? I guess, but um, the, the, there have been the, the, there have been some that are good and some that are bad. Mm. You know, the the day that we uh, heard that our, our development partner had been acquired wasn't a good one. Yep. Um, it was an even worse one for the team from uh, that company who'd been over in this country uh, and were returning. And the event of takeover happened when they were on a flight. Right. They landed to find they'd been sacked because oh. they were the development team and no development was going to happen. Oh, um, yeah. Equally, the reason they were over was because they were looking to try and acquire uh, Architect at that point because the the project development project had gone so well. Yeah. Um, as you can imagine, the wives of every shareholder had already <laughs> spent the money. Um, so when it didn't happen, that was a that was a, a low point. A, a lot of explaining to do when you got home. Point. Yeah, a lot of explaining <laughs> to do. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. Um, but yeah, the, I suppose the other another highlight was literally putting lenses on eye. We we do internal tests Absolutely. here where we, we test the lens before it goes too far. And so uh, to actually put a contact lens on your eye and say, yes, we made it. That was a, a, a breakthrough moment, if you like. Absolutely. And I, and I guess kind of when you get that feedback from people about, you know, in the surveys, etc., that uh, it is more comfortable, etc. I mean, that must be hugely rewarding. That It's not just you guys saying it. It's somebody kind of third party saying it as well. Yes. Yeah. yeah. No, no, I, exactly right. You, you're always looking for corroboration. Um, the, the industry is based around data yep. um, and, and proof that something works. Um, so, yeah, that's that's hugely important. And everybody gets a lift from that as well. Brilliant. So you kind of alluded to already, but kind of uh, what are your, your main hopes and objectives for the next 12 months and kind of the next three years, manufacturing, etc.? You know, is, is there other R&D going on? Kind of what, what are you looking to do? Yeah, no, the, there's constantly R&D going on because we're constantly looking at ways of improving things. Um, we're hiring a number of science staff as well to give us capacity to, to do even more in that area yep. uh, going forward. I think that's important. The, the goals for the next, the short term is um, we want to take the technology we have and get some um, license or commercial income into the business. Yep. Um, that's what we hope to do within the next six to 12 months. Um, thereafter, we're looking at raising the money then that will allow us to go into uh, manufacture at scale. We yeah. do very small pilot uh, manufacture here just now for R&D purposes, but we need to uh, replicate that on a much larger scale. Um, and you know, thereafter, once we're into manufacture, that's when we, we then start to look to sell licenses of the technology and also the manufacturing process going forward. So yeah. uh, those are the goals, effectively. Brilliant, exciting times ahead then. That's great. Um, Thank you. When we're doing these uh, these podcasts, we, we like to speak to the people, just kind of bit of give our, our, our viewers, our, our listeners, a bit of a, a kind of an idea of the people behind the companies that Deep is investing in. Um, so kind of away from away from the office, kind of uh, what what's, uh, what are your personal interests? 
Um, I, I, unfortunately, or fortunately, as my wife thinks, I'm a workaholic. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and she tells me I should never retire because I would just get in the way. Um, so, uh, I, and, and that's probably fair. Um, in terms of hobbies, I, I, uh, I'm into sport is my big distraction, if you like. So, uh, I, um, I enjoy hugely sports such as cricket um i watch football a lot uh, play a bit of golf and i'm not as good as i used to um <laughs> but but sport is probably the biggest thing i like watching tennis and i definitely can't play it but i like yep. watching it um it's, so it's find a way to switch off away from the office absolutely i guess just yeah that, that's mind, the main distraction so uh, it's uh, it's what i tend to to, to look at to relax yeah very good i think that's uh, when we're doing this podcast i think that's a commonality is that i think you've got to be to do what you do to be kind of an entrepreneur running a, a growth business you've got to be a workaholic to a degree but it's also making sure that you've got that time and that space to kind of clear your head and uh, and, and focus and uh, yeah not not get burnt out i guess i think that's a key mm. thing for everyone mm. yeah and can you tell us a little bit more about the team as well as yourself um and kind of their roles and uh, and experiences within architect We've got a good team here from from board downwards. Um, I'm I, I have been running as finance director historically, but I've moved up yep. after this round to chair uh, the company. Uh, and we've brought in uh, Stuart White, uh, who Dr. Stuart White, who has a, a huge experience in in companies that floated companies as well from a science perspective, um, and so there is a real science bent to yeah. this company um, also on the board uh, is uh, jim barton um, he used to be a, a senior uh, vice president uh, of bosch and lom uh, in america um, and he heard about our technology and loved it so much he came to join us after Great. he retired Great. from, us. from yeah. there um, and uh, in terms of uh, also a, a key figure in the industry uh, is our major science director, Rod, Dr. Roderick Bowers. Uh, he invented the ProClear uh, contact lens, okay. which still sells millions every year. Yep. Um, and uh, he and Jim Barton are known by everybody in the industry. It's quite embarrassing when you walk down an exhibition hall behind these two uh, and, and you're a nobody in the, in the <laughs> contact lens field and they just wave to everybody as they go yep. down. It's like royalty. So uh, there is nobody they do not know uh, or have access to in the industry. So and, then, and, then, and then you bring the commerciality to it to, to help them drive the business forward. Absolutely. Well, that's right. And, and uh, you know, obviously uh, we've got the support of our investors, Deep Bridge uh, and IIG PLC, who have been helping enormously in recent times. Uh, so it's a, it's a really good balance of a board. And just one last question for me, I guess. You've obviously worked in sports previously. Um, you, you mentioned uh, with, with Dundee United. Um, are there any similarities that you've taken away from working in that sporting environment, even if on the commercial side, that you've taken into commercial world since then? Yes, I, I, I would say there are, because it, it, um, all the time you are trying to manage the team. Yep. Um, and, and I use the analogy with a lot of people I work with is we need to keep our shape. Yep. which means you need to uh, have a structure in how you run the business, have a structure in your finances, have a structure in your pricing and your costing, um, just similar to a football team keeping its shape. Yep. But also from a people perspective, everybody in your organization is different. And, and you cannot run a, an organization with a one-size-fits-all approach. And you literally have to work out who are your key players? How do you treat them? And yep. you treat them differently to make sure you get the best out of all of them. So it's about tuning up the engine to make it all work very, very well together. Yep. Um, so that it is using yep. sporting uh, lessons, if you yep. like. Absolutely. From that okay, so our, our last question we, we, we love to ask people is uh, the Deep Beach Dinner Party. Um, you're allowed to invite three people to join you. Um, it can be dead or alive, um, but no friends or family. We don't want to upset anybody by leaving them off the list. So uh, who would you be inviting? Um, to be honest, I've been thinking about uh, who I would invite to something like that. Uh, it's it's not an easy one for me, but um, 
I probably would follow uh, two of them. I would go into the sporting field. Um, one in particular, I've always had huge admiration for, um, was uh, the English cricket captain Mike Brearley. Okay. Um, who I always felt was unusual uh, because he was not the best ever Test player okay. uh, by a long chalk, but he was probably the best manager of people that okay. there ever were. And he had to manage one of the greatest talents and uh, you know, unique people in, in Ian Botham. Um, and, yeah. and so he, uh, that was certainly an era where I, I watched him, watched how he performed, watched how he uh, managed people and hugely, uh, hugely affected by that. And, and yeah. that would be a person I would find him hugely interesting to listen to. I think, I think in sport, it's always interesting, isn't it? Because you get two types of leaders. These, either those that lead by example because they are the best or you get those mm. that are just great with people. And like, yeah, I guess yeah. they're the ones that are quite interesting to say, see their take yeah. on things. So, yeah. so who are your I, other two guests? Yeah, yeah well, I, I would follow the same analogy and I would move into golf and Butch Harmon would be okay. at the top of my list. Um, you know, he's coached the greatest in the world. Um, and uh, okay, he's now retired and his son is uh, emerging on the scene in a similar fashion. But... Um, he even more uh, than Brearley, I I find him a tremendous raconteur when I watch him, and Absolutely. he's great to listen to. So uh, I was going to say he's, but, got but, the, he's got one of the great voices of TV or radio. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. Uh, but he, he obviously has something in terms of both identification of talent and, yeah. and getting that over. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah. Uh, and that, number three. Um, well, number three, I, I, I swithered about whether um, to mention Jim McLean, who was, um, I, I live in Dundee, and, and sure. Dundee United's my football team. Yeah. Um, and he, one of the great managers uh, yeah. in the game, who again had huge insight into what happens. Um, I, I had the, the advantage, I um, for my sins, I got involved with the club uh, because my family originally owned it back in the 1920s. Okay. Right. Um, and uh, more recently in my professional career, I was asked in uh, to help uh, get Jim McLean, who was a shareholder, out by Jim McLean. <laughs> um, he needed an exit. Uh, sure. He'd retired as manager and he needed an exit. And so um, I got a call and, and ended up as chairman of United. And, and it right. was an experience to work with Jim. Yep. Um, he, he was a legend. He, he was known uh, as a cantankerous so-and-so um, by everybody who knew him. Yep. But his ability uh, to deliver football results was shown where Dundee United went all the way in Europe um, to, to cup finals. And you know, for a provincial team, oh, um, I mean, it was just absolutely incredible. And, and, he, his, his, and his, his kind of his uh, standing and his success is probably not that widely known outside of Scotland. I mean, certainly south of the That's border. Right. And I think, you know, you yeah. look at the similar yeah. time you had Fergie, at Aberdeen, etc. Yep. And uh, Jim yeah. McLean kind of kind of didn't get the same kind of kudos, but is, is certainly one of the most highly regarded men in Scotland in terms of football, yeah. Well, that's right. And, and he had this ability to look ahead. Mm -hmm. um, yes, he had uh, rough edges around him, but I always remember uh, sitting beside him watching a match and listening to him as the match unfolded. Uh, and so I, at that time when I went in uh, to the club to be the chairman, Jim sat beside me at a game and he would go, um, that winger, the, the defender's not close enough to him, there's going to be a problem. And he then repeated that about five times over the next three minutes. Right. Uh, at which point the winger crossed the ball and the opposition scored. <laughs> to which he jumped up and said, why doesn't the manager see that? <laughs> yeah, uh, it's true though. But, it, but it, it summed up what was so unique about this man. He could see the problem before it happened. Um, and that explains an awful lot as to why he was able to manage uh, yep. so brilliantly. Yeah. Uh, see, I think you, you've kind of uh, got me sidetracked here. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to make this into a football or sports <laughs> podcast, but, but sadly we, we have to talk a bit about work as well. <laughs> well, Scott, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate you joining us and uh, I look forward to catching up with you soon. Thank you for joining us. If you'd like to discuss any specific topics in future Discovery podcasts, please email us at discovery at deepbridgecapital.com. This podcast was brought to you by Deepbridge Capital LLP. Deepbridge is authorised and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority. 
Please note that investments discussed are both illiquid and high risk and won't be suitable for all investors and should be considered as part of a diversified portfolio. The content of this podcast should not be construed as financial or taxation advice. We recommend investors seek appropriate professional financial advice. Any views expressed may no longer be current and may have already been acted upon.